You're welcome tonight. Let's tell you that Donald Trump delivered a victory speech at the Palm Beach Country Convention Center in Florida as he emerged winner of the presidential election after beating Kamala Harris in a stunning White House comeback. In his address, he called for national unity, urging the American people to put the division of the past four years behind them. Trump was joined by his family as he celebrated the moment uh, with supporters who chanted USA. This was a movement like nobody's ever seen before. And frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. There's never been anything like this in this country and maybe beyond. America has given us an unprecedented and powerful mandate. We have taken back Control of the Senate. Wow, that's good. It's time to put the divisions of the past four years behind us. It's time to unite. And we're going to try. We're going to try. We have to try. And it's going to happen. Success will bring us together. I've seen that. I've seen that. They came from all quarters, union, non-union, African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American, Arab-American. Muslim American, we had everybody, and it was beautiful. It was a historic realignment. This is a great job. There's no job like this. This is the most important job in the world. And now we begin with updates on the U.S. elections, where U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has called Donald Trump to congratulate him for winning the 2024 presidential election. Now, this was disclosed by one of her senior aides following a bitter and contentious race. Democrat Harris discussed with Trump the importance of a peaceful transfer of power and being a president for all Americans. Now, meanwhile, world leaders have begun to react to the election of Donald Trump as the 47th U.S. president. Our German Chancellor Olaf Scholz on Wednesday congratulated Trump and urged uh, continued close transatlantic ties, saying they are better off together. Similarly, Japan's Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba says he wants to take his country's alliance with the U.S. to new heights. Donald Trump claimed victory in the U.S. presidential election. Meanwhile, Sweden's, uh, Sweden's Prime Minister says that Donald Trump's election as U.S. President could mean less aid for Ukraine in its war against Russia. Ulf Christensen also fears a return to economic protectionism in the United States, a major risk for a country like Sweden, which is highly dependent on exports. From the transatlantic partnership, profitieren beide sides. Die EU und die USA sind zwei ähnlich große Wirtschaftsräume, verbunden durch die engsten wirtschaftlichen Beziehungen weltweit. Deutschland und die Vereinigten Staaten sind sich in einer über Jahrzehnte gewachsenen Partnerschaft, ja Freundschaft, verbunden. Unsere menschlichen Verbindungen in die USA sind enger als in jedes andere Land außerhalb Europas. Millionen amerikanische Bürger haben deutsche Wurzeln. Und deshalb gilt we are better off together. Gemeinsam können wir viel mehr durchsetzen als gegeneinander. Trump Trump氏の勝利宣言を聞きました。連携を密にしながら日米同盟、日米関係、これをさらなる高みに引き上げてまいりたいと考えております。今後トランプ氏と接点を早急に持つべく努力をしてまいりたいと考えておるところであります。en annan risk som finns det är ett minskat engagemang för Ukraina. Jag tänker inte intäkta det i förväg. Tvärtom skulle jag säga att vi tar fasta på det faktum att USA är den hittills enskilt största militära bidragsgivaren till Ukraina. På andra plats kommer, som ni vet, om vi lägger samman de nordiska och baltiska staterna, vi. Därefter kommer Tyskland.
Now, similarly, President Bola Tinumbu has extended his congratulations to Donald Trump on his re-election at the 47th or as the 47th President of the United States. In a statement issued by the Special Advisor of Information and Strategy, Bayo Nanuga, President Tinubu expressed optimism about deepening ties between Nigeria and the United States. Tinubu emphasized that Trump's victory demonstrates the trust and confidence Americans placed in his leadership, applauding the commitment of the U.S. to democratic values. Reflecting on Trump's previous experience as the 45th president, President Tinubu expressed confidence that Trump's return to office would foster a new era of productive, mutually beneficial economic and development partnerships between Africa and the United States. Now live to discuss the effects of Trump's emergence as the U.S. president on Nigeria and Africa, we are joined by the CEO Asha Investment Limited, Mukhtar Mohammed. Also joining us is a public policy analyst, Magnus Oibe. Now, gentlemen, you're welcome. Now, Mr. Magnus, I'm going thank to start you, with you. you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with you, Magnus. Um, uh, in your opinion, what factors led to the victory of Donald Trump, as we have seen? The uh, factors are um, a very good evening to yours. Um, and thank you for having me. The factors are very clear. Um, Donald Trump is an authentic person and a leader. Um, people can read and understand him very easily. He's uh, not a professional politician, so does not speak in riddles. He makes his position very clear. And um, people thought that was uh, uh, unusual and for obvious reasons, because he has not been a politician for much longer than uh, decades, just 10 years. And um, he is a businessman, very professionally minded. And uh, as we say in simple parliaments, he takes no prisoners. And uh, the people, Americans, understand him. Half of America has been tamed since uh, 2016 when he uh, came the first time. And they remained with him even in the past four years that uh, uh, he, he lost to the incumbent that's uh, now outgoing. So he's a very authentic person. I think Americans understand him, and that's why they voted for him. Okay, then. Um, let me come to you, Mukhtar. Now, we all know Trump's, uh, well, views about Africa. He's referred to many African countries with very uh, unsavory words. But the African Growth and Opportunity Act is set for renewal very soon. Now, with the new Trump presidency, do you think it's going to be renewed or is it going to be ended? Well, it depends. I, I think um, we, we, Trump policy is not just about the African country, whether he will renew that or not. But I think um, Trump is mostly American first before any other nation. So definitely, if that policy favor America, he would definitely renew it because he's going to look at it uh, like uh, my colleague says, he's a, he's a businessman, he's not a normal politician. Mm. We see how workable, how much value that brings to the, the, to the people of America before he will be uh, able to agree to renew, renew that uh, uh, agreement. Uh, but if you look at his antecedent before now, um, you, you, you also realize that it wasn't just uh, one part for Africa, especially Nigeria. It was sometimes easily forgot that Trump was the president that approved our the purchase of the Alpha Jet for the fight against terrorism. Um, even when then President Barack Obama did not uh, um, approve that. So Trump is definitely look at um, what really is going to benefit America. He's not a normal politician, and if the um, the, the trade agreement is going to be beneficial for American businesses, he will sign it. Mm. Okay. Now, gentlemen, um, from Trump's past presidency, he seems not to have a good relationship with uh, NATO. So what do you think his emergence portends for a Western alliance? Mr. Magnus, let me come to you. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't have a sour relationship with NATO. He, he has always uh, been in support of NATO. He told that he asked them, um, to carry their weight. NATO was not uh, contributing to... I mean, the European countries were not contributing to uh, the uh, funding of NATO. And he 
made them do that. The uh, immediate past uh, NATO Secretary General uh, Yang, you know, uh, did to point out that it was when um, Trump them under pressure that the European countries paid off. So he's not against uh, NATO, but he just wants NATO to carry their weight. And as you pointed out, America affects MAGA. And he's been doing that. But he has interest in Nigeria. Definitely, I can tell you that. He knows about Nigeria. He knows the potentials of Nigeria. And uh, he has always uh, been interested in helping Nigeria out. I don't think he's going to scrap uh, Agoa if he has any benefit. But I, I, I even don't even know how Nigerians are benefiting from Agoa. Because initially, it was um, uh, Asian countries that set up uh, shops in the African countries, manufacturing from Africa to export to uh, the U.S. And that's what gave them concerns that they were thinking of actually scrapping uh, scrapping the uh, the, uh, the Agoa project that was started by uh, Clinton, I think, whatever. You know, so President Trump is, uh, you know, not against Africa by any means. And I believe that um, uh, his emergence as a president uh, uh, solidates mm. uh, interest in uh, Nigeria, especially because of the relationship that had with him, had well, with him personally, and yeah. the U.S. in particular, because we're actually, you know, a strategic country in Africa. I'm sure you are aware that uh, the U.S. is building the biggest uh, embassy in the world, their biggest embassy in the world in the co-Atlantic city here in Lagos. Mm. So it shows that the U.S. has interest in it. Yeah, we just have to um, buckle up, just have to key into uh, the available uh, uh, um, um, areas that we can be able to make the best of and harness the benefits that are available. Mm. Well, yes, Mr. Magnus, we do remember that uh, we, we do know that Trump absolutely knows Nigeria. We remember how he described our past president from before. Um, oh. Very memorable. Um, in any case, Mr. Yes, Mukata, I mentioned to you that Trump is, a, you know, that Trump is a very direct person. Mm. He does not take prisoners, and he speaks about things the way he feels about them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when he mentioned what you said, he said about the president, that was his correct and exact impression. Mm -hmm. He's not a nuanced person. He's not a typical politician. So he's very straight and direct, which is what is good for us, because we know where he stands at every point in time. Okay. And what you said also about initially, about uh, him uh, uh, saying something about Africa and stuff like that, they are not true. They have not been proven to be true. So that is completely untrue, and he has stated that many times. Mm. Okay, so we, we've seen America go from a very hardline immigration policy, or policies rather, to a very softer one during the Biden immigra uh, administration. And now... It's going back to Trump. Now, how, how do Trump's immigration policies differ, and what impact could these policies have on the U.S. economy and African nations? Now, Mr. Mukhtar, let me come to you on that one. Well, um, you, you have to also look at it this way, that uh, most of um, Trump's um, hardline um, immigration policy have to do with um, the South America. The, the border between um, America and, uh, and, 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 and Mexico. I think that's where you see those hardline uh, immigration policy. Um, because, uh, like, as Nigerians, uh, the, the only way we go into America is through the airport. And though we have issues that have to do with a lot of Nigerians not, um, not coming back overstaying. I remember at that time, Trump has to look at that and realize that a lot of Nigerians were overstaying. And then he, he decided um, to say everybody should come in for visa appointment and uh, issues like that. And we did. But after that, you've seen that we have a better relationship. We, now Nigerians have been issued five-year visa by American government, which is uh, something very good. Now, when you talk about um, it's in the impact, I think it's going to have um, a negative impact on them when you talk about immigration, because some of the cheap labor some of the American companies enjoy are from immigrants and especially African immigrants. So definitely there will be a negative impact in terms of cost of doing business in, uh, in America. But again, um, that is the, the hard line, like I said, in sideline policy on immigration um, normally has to deal with um, the, 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 those that come through the, the, the border through Mexico. Remember, I talked about the building the wall and he has kept talking about building the wall. So I, I think, again, his policy will have a negative impact 
on American uh, businesses because of the cheap labor they, 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 they enjoy, especially from immigrants and Africans. Okay. All right. So, gentlemen, my final question will be to both of you, but uh, I'll ask you first, Mr. Mukhtar. Um, how do you think Trump's going to approach uh, global relationships now, particularly regarding China and international partnerships? Uh, and what are the implications? What, what implications could we see for African nations as well? Uh, Mr. Mukhtar, you go first. In 30 seconds, because we have to round this up. Okay, with, with this relationship, remember you have said it, American first, it will see tariff for China company. Chinese are not happy that Trump has won. So that will also drive China into a new partnership, and that partnership might be beneficial to Africa. And also, you see American business also will also look for new partners for strategic expansion and growth, and they will definitely have that partnership with Africa. So whichever way it goes, I think the Africans will, will definitely benefit more from a, from a Trump high tariff, good for for, for our, for Chinese business looking for new partners and American business also looking for expansion and coming to Africa. So which way? I think it's going to be a win-win for Africa. Uh, Mr. Magnus, do you agree? Yes, certainly. Uh, you know, um, a lot of people are thinking, you know, based on uh, the uh, rumor of conspiracy theory that uh, Trump uh, referred to Africa as a shit country. Africa is a continent in the first instance. So he wouldn't have said Africa is a shit country. You know, the point... The real reality is that, you know, not across the world, people don't like, um, don't like uh, illegal immigrants. You know, as Trump said this morning, when he was uh, acknowledging um, his leadership in the polls, he mentioned that he does not hate immigrants. He only dislikes illegal immigrants. In Nigeria here, in 1984, there about, we sent away Ghanaians who were here illegally. Not long ago, South Africans sent us away as well. Ghana has been having issues with us, you know, and stuff like that. So Trump is not against immigrants. Legal immigrants can work and thrive in America, and they are thriving, especially those in the tech, in the medical world, and stuff like that. Tech, you know, Trump is a very strategic person, so he's going to engage everybody. I, I'm sure during his first tenure, when he started engaging North Korea, people thought there was going to be a world war, there was going to be a nuclear, you know, at common, whatever. That didn't happen. Later, he courted the leader of that recluse country and became, you know, friends with him. So Trump is not going to be an autarky. He's going to trade with all the countries of the world, but he's going to negotiate with them to get the best for America. He's going to apply the skills that he, he, he founded in his book, Out of the Deal, you know, that's what's going to happen. He's a businessman and he's going to extract the most benefit. But he also knows when he has to let go because it has to be a win-win. So it's not going to be uh, as bad, as uh, as terrible as people are making it seem. I believe that uh, Trump's emergence as the president of the United States of America is going to be progress to both Africa and to the United States. I want to say thank you very much, Mr. Mukta Mohammed and Mr. Magnus Oyibe. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank now, coming up... Condolence pour in as Nigeria mourns the death of Chief of Army Staff Tauri Dlagbaja. We'll bring you the details after the break. And now, we continue in Nigeria. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has ordered the rescheduling of the Federal Executive Council meeting following the demise of Chief of Army Staff Lieutenant General Tauri Dlagbaja. The president noted that a new date for the meeting will be announced later. The FEC meeting was initially scheduled for today, that's Wednesday, but had to be postponed in honor of late Lagbaja, who passed away on Tuesday night. General Lagbaja served as the chief of army staff from June 19, 2023, till his death on November 5, 2024. Bayo Nanugas, special advisor to the president on information and strategy, in a statement said President Tinubu has also ordered flags to be flown at half staff, uh, mast nationwide for seven days in honor of the departed general. And now we go live to Washington, D.C., where Kamala Harris is about to make her concession speech. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let me say, and I love you back. And I love you back. So let me say, my heart is full today. My heart is full today, full of gratitude for the trust you have placed in me
full of love for our country and full of resolve. The outcome of this election is not what we wanted, not what we fought for, not what we voted for, but hear me when I say, hear me when I say, the light of America's promise will always burn bright. As long as we never give up and as long as we keep fighting. To my beloved Doug and our family, I love you so very much. To President Biden and Dr. Biden, thank you for your faith and support. To Governor Walls and the Walls family, I know your service to our nation will continue. And to my extraordinary team, to the volunteers who gave so much of themselves, to the poll workers and the local election officials, I thank you, I thank you all. Look, I am so proud of the race we ran and the way we ran it, and the way we ran it. Over the 107 days of this campaign, we have been intentional about building community and building coalitions, bringing people together from every walk of life and background, united by love of country, with enthusiasm and joy in our fight for America's future. And we did it with the knowledge that we all have so much more in common than what separates us. Now I know folks are feeling and experiencing a range of emotions right now. I get it. <laughs> But we must accept the results of this election. Earlier today, I spoke with President-elect Trump and congratulated him on his victory. I also told him that we will help him and his team with their transition, and that we will engage in a peaceful transfer of power. A fundamental principle of American democracy is that when we lose an election, we accept the results. That principle, as much as any other, distinguishes democracy from monarchy or tyranny. And anyone who seeks the public trust must honor it. At the same time, in our nation, we owe loyalty not to a president or a party, but to the Constitution of the United States. And loyalty to our conscience and to our God. My allegiance to all three is why I am here to say, while I concede this election, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign. The fight, the fight for freedom, for opportunity, for fairness, and the dignity of all people. A fight for the ideals at the heart of our nation, the ideals that reflect America at our best. That is a fight I will never give up. I will never give up the fight for a future where Americans can pursue their dreams, ambitions, and aspirations, where the women of America have the freedom to make decisions about their own body and not have their government telling them what to do. We will never give up the fight to protect our schools and our streets from gun violence. 
and America, we will never give up the fight for our democracy, for the rule of law, for equal justice, and for the sacred idea that every one of us, no matter who we are or where we start out, has certain fundamental rights and freedoms that must be respected and upheld. And we will continue to wage this fight in the voting booth, in the courts, and in the public square. And we will also wage it in quieter ways, in how we live our lives, by treating one another with kindness and respect, by looking in the face of a stranger and seeing a neighbor, by always using our strength to lift people up, to fight for the dignity that all people deserve. The fight for our freedom will take hard work, but like I always say, we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work can be joyful work. And the fight for our country is always worth it. It is always worth it. To the young people who are watching, it is... <laughs> to the young people who are watching, it is okay to feel sad and disappointed. But please know it's going to be okay. On the campaign, I would often say, when we fight, we win. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Sometimes the fight takes a while. That doesn't mean we won't win. That doesn't mean we won't win. The important thing is don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop trying to make the world a better place. You have power. You have power. And don't you ever listen. When anyone tells you something is impossible because it has never been done before. You have the capacity to do extraordinary good in the world. And so to everyone who is watching, do not despair. This is not a time to throw up our hands. This is a time to roll up our sleeves. This is a time to organize, to mobilize, and to stay engaged for the sake of freedom and justice and the future that we all know we can build together. Look, many of you know I started out as a prosecutor, and throughout my career, I saw people at some of the worst times in their lives, people who had suffered great harm and great pain, and yet found within themselves the strength and the courage and the resolve to take the stand, to take a stand, to fight for justice, to fight for themselves, to fight for others. So let their courage be our inspiration. Let their determination be our charge. And I'll close with this. There's an adage an historian once called a law of history, true of every society across the ages. The adage is, only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. I know many people feel like we are entering a dark time, but for the benefit of us all, I hope that is not the case. But here's the thing, America, if it is, let us fill the sky 
with the light of a brilliant, brilliant billion of stars. The light, the light of optimism, of faith, of truth, and service. Concession speech there by the Vice President of the United States, who has just, well, conceded to Donald Trump, the President-elect of the U.S. Well, sometimes, like she said, it might be the darkest, but that's when we see the stars. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, let's bring it back here to Nigeria. Now, the End Bad Governance Movement in Lagos has urged President Tinubu to withdraw charges against all protesters currently detained or on trial, including Michael Lenin and 10 others, whose trial for treason is scheduled to commence at the Federal High Court in Abuja on Friday. This call comes after the release of 114 detained protesters, including minors, on Tuesday, November 5th. The movement noted that the charges against those released and the 11 others still incarcerated are broadly similar and as such demands the release of the remaining detainees and a public apology amongst other demands. To underscore their demands, the movement has declared Friday, November 8th, which coincides with the treason trial of the 11 protesters as a day for a peaceful solidarity rally demanding their freedom. A government. All that the government has against them are call logs, phone, telephone. Some of these items are repeated two or three times in the so called proof of evidence. The truth of the matter. We're going to short break now, and when we come back, more news tonight. And you're welcome back tonight, just in time for business, as we move on to our business desk for business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Electricity distribution companies in Nigeria, DISCOs, have implemented new price increases for electricity meters, the second in just four months. As of November 5, 2024, the cost for a single phase meter has jumped from around 117,000 naira to up to 149,000 naira 800 depending on the specific distribution company and meter vendor. This latest adjustment follows the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission's directive to deregulate meter asset providers, impacting meter pricing across the board. The back-to-back -back hikes since August 2024 have raised consumer concerns regarding the affordability and accessibility of electricity metering in the country amidst ongoing economic pressures. Ghana's annual consumer inflation rose for the second consecutive month in October, reaching 22.1%, up from 21.5% in September, according to the Ghana Statistical Service. Government statistician Samuel Kobina Anim highlighted that food, housing, water, fuel and transport expenses accounted for around two-thirds of the inflation rate. October's figure marks the highest inflation rate since June, as Ghana continues to grapple with its most most severe economic crisis in decades. Last month, Ghana made significant progress on its debt restructuring, securing investor approval to overhaul $13 billion in international bonds and reached an agreement with the IMF on the third review of its $3 billion loan program. 
Up north, inflation in Egypt surged to an estimated 27% in October, driven by increased education expenses and a mid-month fuel price hike, according to a poll of 17 analysts. This marks the third consecutive monthly rise following 26.4% inflation in September. Analysts attribute the October increase primarily to revised education costs, typically accounted for in that month. Contributing factors include a record 29.59% year-on-year growth in Egypt's M2 money supply in September, along with fuel price hikes of up to 17% in October, metro fare increases, and electricity tariff hikes. Inflation has eased from a peak of 38% in September 2023, with the central bank's lending rates now at a positive 28.25%. In Southern Africa, Zimbabwe's gold-backed currency, the ZIG, rose against the dollar for a second day following tighter monetary measures by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. The currency, introduced in April, appreciated by 4% to 26.90 per dollar on Tuesday, extending gains seen on Monday, the first rise since mid-October. In the unofficial market, however, the ZIG remains between 35 to 40 per dollar. Economic analyst Prosper Chitambara attributes the gains to recent central bank actions, including devaluation, a hike in interest rates from 20 to 35 percent, and increased reserve requirements. However, he cautioned that sustaining the currency's strength may be challenging with increased dollar demand anticipated during the agricultural season as farmers buy seeds, fertilizer, and other essential inputs for planting. And that's all on Business News. I am Likon on Obanjo. And now in sports, Victor Osime makes a return to the Super Eagles squad as interim coach. Arsene Guavon released uh, his uh, squad list for the 2025 uh, Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers against Benin and Rwanda. Now Doka Njoku has more on this. Sports Update. Brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. Super Eagles interim coach Austin Aguavo has announced the 23-man squad for Nigeria's upcoming 2025 Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers against Rwanda and Benin. The squad sees the return of Victor Osimen and Sadiq Umar as the 2013 AFCON champions aim to secure their spots in next year's tournament, which is set to hold in Morocco. Nigeria currently lead Group D with 10 points, needing just one more point to guarantee qualification for the 2025 tournament. The Super Eagles will first face Benin in Abidjan on the 14th of November, followed by a home fixture against Rwanda in Uyo on the 18th of November. Nigeria's under-18 men handball team have been crowned champions of the IHF Trophy Africa Men Continental Face in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The coach Emeka Namani led side secured a 38 to 26 points victory over Guinea in the final. Aziz Sulaiman Olaiton was voted the most valuable player of the match. With the win, Nigeria has now qualified for the IHF Trophy Intercontinental Face, which will be played in 2025 in a yet to be known country where they will represent Africa in the under 18 category. The sixth Lagos Para Table Tennis is set to commence on Thursday at the Maladi Okoya Thomas Hall of the Teslim Balogun Stadium in Lagos, where players from the United Kingdom, Iran, Iraq, Cameroon, Benin Republic, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, and host Nigeria will compete. President of the Paralympic Committee of Nigeria, Sunday Odebode, was impressed by the significant growth in participation with players from Europe, Asia, and Africa confirming their attendance. And the players will get ranking points. Uh, this is a Factor 20 event, as it was uh, last year. And uh, yes, this will count for the uh, race for the World Championships that will take place in 20, uh, 2026 in Thailand. So it is uh, one of the first events on the race for the World Championships. This competition, uh, Lagos Value Jet Paratable Tennis, has discovered many Paratable Tennis 
which we know in this country. Um, we also expect a big uh, upset from this tournament. It's a ranking tournament. It's Papa Masata Diak, the son of former Global Athletic Supremo Lamin Diak, had his five-year prison sentence for corruption involving Russian doping cases confirmed by a Paris appeals court on Thursday. Diak, who was sentenced in absentia because he refused to leave his native Senegal, had his fine from the original trial reduced by half to 500,000 euros. Diak, whose father, Lamin Diak, headed the IWAF, now World Athletics, from 1999 to 2015, was one of the six men convicted in France in 2020 for hushing up 23 Russian doping offenses in exchange for Russian sponsorship contracts. Masata Diak was found guilty of being an accomplice in a bribery scheme and of having embezzled funds to the tune of 15 million euros at the expense of the IWAF. And that's a wrap on Sports Update. I am Udoka Njoko. You're just in time for entertainment news up next tonight. On entertainment news, Nigerian music executive Muiwa Awoni, also known as Donna One, recently shared the story behind Thames' Grammy-winning collaboration Wait For You with Drake and Future. Thames, who rose to global fame with hits like Essence, has since worked with major artists such as Rihanna and Beyonce. Her feature on Wait For You earned her two Grammy nominations and led to her first win in the 65th Annual Grammy Awards. In a recent interview, Donna One revealed the behind-the-scenes details of the collaboration. While Thames and her team were working with Coca-Cola, Donna One received an urgent message from a colleague to check his email. Inside, he found a request from Epic Records, Features label, asking for clearance to use a sample from Thames' song, Higher, for Wait For You. Interestingly, Donawan noted that Drake was not initially part of the track when Thames cleared the sample, adding an unexpected twist to the song's development. As Ghana prepares for its upcoming elections on December 7th, Ghanaian-American comedian Michael Blackson has urged voters to carefully consider their choices. In an interview with Joy News, Michael Blackson reflected on the struggles faced by the Ghanaian economy in recent years, particularly due to the impact of COVID-19, and called on Ghanaians to think critically about the next leader. He emphasized the importance of voting, urging citizens not just to complain about the state of the country, but actively participate in the electoral process. Additionally, Blackson reminded Ghanaians to prioritize faith and the personal responsibility, advising them to put God first and not rely solely on leaders to improve their lives. He also shared his intention to explore the potential careers in politics driven by a desire to help the community rather than for personal gain. Blackson is currently focused on learning more about politics to become an effective leader. The highly anticipated Michael Jackson biopic is hitting the big screen a bit later than originally planned. Starring Jaffa Jackson, Michael Jackson's nephew, the film is created by Antoine Fakwa and was initially set for release on April 18, 2025. However, it has been confirmed that the film's release date has been pushed to October 5, 2025. The biopic, titled Michael, is being distributed by Lionsgate in the U.S. and Universal Pictures internationally. The film boasts of impressive cast like Coleman Domingo and and Mia Long portraying Michael's parents, Joseph and Catherine Jackson. Lawrence Tate and Kat Graham will play music mogul Barry Gordy and legendary singer Diana Ross, respectively. Produced by Graham King, the producer behind Bohemian Rhapsody, the film's screenplay is written by Oscar nominee John Logan. Fans of the King of Pop can look forward to a star-studded and captivating portrayal of his legendary life. Bruno Mars has set a new milestone on Spotify, becoming the first artist to surpass 125.4 million monthly listeners, with a precise total of 125,443,715 listeners. Mars has broken his own streaming records, claiming the title for the highest number of monthly listeners in Spotify's history. This achievement underscores his continued relevance and widespread appeal, as his music resonates with fans across the globe. Mars's record-breaking success is a testament to his extensive catalog of chart-topping hits which have maintained their popularity over time. This milestone also highlights the growing importance of streaming platforms in the modern music. And that's all tonight. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories we brought your way. Kamala Harris has sent congratulations and world leaders react after Donald Trump emerges 47th President of the United States. Condolences pour in as Nigeria mourns the death of Chief of Army Staff Tao Reid Lagwaja. 
An NBAT governance movement has demanded release of protesters still in detention to protest November 8th. Now, to remember now, you can watch New Central Live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times, Channel 274, AVO TV, and of course on YouTube. Many thanks for watching tonight. My name is Mazino Appeal.